Okay, um, a big welcome to everybody. Uh, my name is Brian Cummings and I have the almost impossible task of introducing Adam Phillips. So this is the first lecture of the academic year 2021-22 uh, in this series, which takes place uh, at the University of York. But actually this uh, is a series of lectures that's been going, going on for 15 years now, uh, during which time Adam has served as visiting professor, which in fact makes Adam well, one of the longest serving members now of the Department of English and Literature. I really like, thought that you would like to hear that, Adam. Certainly a lot longer than I've been here. So it is neither an unknown pleasure uh, to invite him, nor an unforbidden pleasure to listen to him, but it is a new beginning, nonetheless, for all of us here. I feel very conscious about this. I am a, uh, a university lecturer by, by profession. I, I do this sort of thing, but because of a couple of accidents to do with research grants and things like that, this is the first time I've been in a lecture room for 18 months, and I'm, I'm scared. Um, some of you will have been in them a lot more often and perhaps are, are beginning to feel happier about it. But certainly public lectures are only just beginning to come back into the mainstream now. Um, and I suppose the first thing that I want to reflect on this evening uh, in, in welcoming Adam back um, is how wonderful it is to be in a public lecture again. Um, how wonderful public lectures are, how important they are, and how they at some level represent what a university is actually for. Um, that is, ideas in a room, face to face, person to person, old and young, uh, a voice speaking in the dark. Those of you who are hearing Adam uh, for the first time are in for something, I think, extraordinary. Of course it is a lecture, uh, it's the oldest format of the university, historically. And Adam, indeed, uh, as if cocking a snook at the current obsession with ex uh, innovation and teaching excellence frameworks is super old fashioned. He will just get up, he will read a script, and he will stop. So there will be no media, no PowerPoint, uh, and in that way he recalls for us the uh, meaning of the word lectura in medieval Latin, which is a reading rather than uh, what we call a lecture. He reads aloud in two senses, in that a lot of what he says is in the form of reading of other writers. In his own words, from his introduction to Freud, he makes us wonder, among many other things, what we may be doing when we are reading. What the desire to read is a desire for. That's a fantastic sentence. In the silence, with no gimmicks to help us bide away the time, we are forced to listen very hard and to follow several steps behind what it is that he is reading and what it is that we are desiring when we are reading. Just as remarkable is the Q&A session in which, in this occasion, the roles are reversed. And Adam makes me feel, I think perhaps other people feel, as if we are the one having questions asked of us uh, and we are the ones who are looking for the answers uh, rather than him. Adam Phillips, as you all know, is a distinguished child psycho psychotherapist as well as a psychoanalyst and writer. He's the general editor of the new Penguin Freud and the sole editor of the Penguin Freud Reader, a book which is like a TARDIS in that it is the same size as other books but appears to contain far more Freud essays in it that can possibly fit inside. Um, his latest books, uh, Attention Seeking, and uh, on wanting, wanting to Change 2021, first appeared as lectures in this room. If his habit of writing about a book a year is simply unbearable to academics who struggle to write one per decade, he is also an inspiration to all the students who are here, since he too is a York English doctoral student, and he too still hasn't finished his thesis. <laughs> when I first arrived in the department then, I couldn't believe my luck that he was here to give a talk at all, never mind a talk every term since I've been here. It's absolutely uh, the, uh, the highlight of every term. And we're right to give thanks in that respect to the Department of English and Related Literature, which hosts him, uh, to Helen Barrett, uh, who uh, looks after him so well, uh, and especially to Anthony O'Carroll, whose generous sponsorship makes these lectures possible. Mm -hmm. 
However, I want to finish my introduction by introducing someone else who is not even here today. Hugh Horton was the originator and muse of these lectures in 2006. Indeed, before that, uh, he was the supervisor of the thesis that never got finished. It's your bad luck that Hugh is not introducing Adam tonight, since his introductions were always another highlight for any evening, pulsating with his wit and his learning, much of it aimed at Adam's expense. There was a special joy and, and suspense in watching Adam's face as he waited, caught between wild praise and humiliation, and sometimes you couldn't tell which was which. Alas, Hugh retired this uh, last summer after a career which spans almost the history of English at York. And as well as Adam, he was responsible for bringing a Homeric host of poets to York, including Seamus Heaney, before he was famous, and indeed also for Heaney's last ever public a reading, a hundred yards away from this room in Central Hall in the summer of 2013. More than that, Hugh is the best reader of poetry in that other sense that I have ever known, just as he is the finest human being I've ever come across in a university setting. This evening is a fitting testimonial to the best and most giving of careers, and since Hugh can't be here tonight, as he's been ill, let's all look forward to welcoming him and his partner Kit Fan back in the new year at the next Phillips Lecture. And meantime, join Hugh in spirit in applauding Adam's lecture tonight with the all too timely title, Reviewing White Fragility, Psychoanalysis with Racism. Thank you all for coming. Well, it is very nice to be back here and to actually see some real people after so long. Um, this paper, as Brian said, is called Reviewing White Fragility, which is the title of a book that some of you may have read, which made something of a, was rather notorious in America, and is actually a very, very interesting book. And it begun, really, with a consideration of that particular book. The epigraph to this is from Richard Rorty's Pragmatism as Anti-Authoritarianism. The distinction between the strategic and non-strategic use of language is just the distinction between cases in which all we care about is convincing others and cases in which we hope to learn something. When I was 17, during a lesson on the history of the slave trade, something suddenly dawned on me which I knew I couldn't say in class. I'd grown up in a middle-class, entirely white Jewish community in which, at least it seemed to me, it was more or less taken for granted, in the light of relatively recent history, that Jews were, in Diane Arbus's phrase, the aristocrats of trauma. So after the lesson, I went up to the teacher and said, of course, it's not a competition, which of course you had to say, but at least Hitler was an idealist. He was trying to improve the world. But the slave traders were just supplying luxuries to rich people. To which the teacher replied, yes, that's true, but luxuries are very important. I was so amazed and freaked out by this that I couldn't think of anything to say. And for several days I was haunted and slightly frightened by this incident. And then, as is the way with certain kinds of bad news, I forgot about it. I was ashamed of the thought at the time and probably glad to discard it. And in retrospect, it has an echo of internalised anti-Semitism. But when I read Robin D'Angelo's White Fragility, subtitled Why It's So Hard for White People to Talk About Racism, I remembered it for what felt like the first time. In retrospect, it seems like a boastful story, and it may be one. But at the time, I was full of trepidation. So whatever else I thought about D'Angelo's book, some of which I will discuss briefly in this paper, this was part of its effect as a kind of reminder or revealing of something. It was strange and not strange to have forgotten. White supremacism as our climate, as the taken for granted, is the very thing white people need not notice because it represents our supposed safety and therefore wished for reality. Clearly people have to be shown what is taken for granted and reminded that it is taken for granted. 
It may be one of the good effects of such books, whatever one thinks of them, that they can be evocative. Its intended effect, though, being to reveal the kinds of difficulties, the kinds of guilty excruciation white people have in talking about race. Of course, as everyone did one way or another, I'd grown up with various kinds of racism, but with nothing like the racism that non-white people grew up with. And I'm not sure now how akin anti-Semitism is to what we now call racism. Jews, apart from everything else, obviously, are, not, are mostly white. I knew that nobody wanted to feel what someone feels when they are the object of the target of any kind of racist abuse or attack. But for me, growing up in the overprotectedness of a more or less middle-class Jewish community, racism could only be one of many things that mattered. We were implicitly persuaded growing up not to have lives overshadowed or preempted by the Holocaust, and by implication by the various forms of racism. Clearly racism is not one thing. Because we knew or thought we knew that racism was unequivocally an evil thing, it was as though we didn't mostly need to think about it. As though by a kind of magical thinking, racism could be abolished by re being recognised and acknowledged. The defence of acknowledgement. As though we just knew what it was. The unenigmatic un aspect of the enigmatic signifier that was racism was the message that to be preoccupied by racism destroyed hope. And was just one more version of being a victim of racism. The complication and binds of all this took me a long time to fully appreciate. D'Angelo's book, at once a how-to book and a what's going on book, which as most people probably know was hugely successful in America and also much reviled in some quarters, was, as I say, a very strong reminder of something. But something from my own past, but also in its reception, a more telling reminder of the questions. What is useful and to whom when we talk and write about racism? And the question of what speaking and writing about racism is supposed to be useful for of what we wanted to do for us. And given that writing and talking about racism precipitates us into such intense and conflicted conscious and unconscious feeling and exposes us to the violent vagaries of our subjectivity. Questions as innocent, Derrida writes, as what does it mean to be right? What does it mean to be right or to prove someone right? To be wrong, to prove someone wrong or to do them wrong? Racists and anti-racists alike, of course, tend to think of themselves as right. Despite my family's obsession with apartheid in South Africa, I had the apparent luxury of apparently not having to be overly preoccupied by real racism until quite late in my adolescence. When I read Sark's The Jew is the Invention of the Anti-Semite, for example, and read about scapegoating and projection, and projective identification and envy in my child psychotherapy training, I felt, I think, pretty much armoured by my supposed psychological knowledge. As though racism was the kind of thing that just needed good explanations, something you needed to have some good ideas about so you could fight it properly. It was clearly, in inverted commas, psychological and to be treated as such, not political or economic. It was many years after psychedelic training that I came across Abraham and Torok's writing about transgenerational haunting, and could remember the concentration camp numbers branded on the hands of some of my grandparents' friends. I was not, though, in actuality, living in a rapidly anti-Semitic culture. I did not live as far as I could see, though other people, of course, had different experiences, as if the taken-for-granted assumption in my culture was that there was something disturbing and degenerate and cruel about Jews. D'Angelo's book makes it clear that privileging any kind of racism when it wasn't just an inevitable after-effect of trauma, could be another of the many forms white supremacism can take. That one form of racism can obscure or occlude another. And it's also part of the problem with her book that white supremacism is accorded a supremacism there is no outside to. And this clearly is the point of the book, part of its truth, and where it can be argued with, not in the pernicious white lives matter way, but rather in the assumption that whiteness like blackness can all too easily be generalised about, as though we don't know how to live without generalisations about ourselves and others. There is after all no ruling ideology, no totality or totalitarian state that actually preempts the possibility of innovation and improvisation and dissent, despite the very real suffering that protest often involves. Every system assumes a protest against it, is organised to offset the anticipated threat to its value. 
When it comes to racism, the conversation needs to be as inclusive as possible. And this, of course, as D'Angelo's book makes abundantly clear, is also where the trouble starts. People competing to be the aristocrats of trauma, or simply speaking in a way that privileges one cultural trauma over another. This is one of the ways the trauma is replicated and reinforced and muddled. Trauma being, by definition, that which is insisted upon, even by being silenced. Racism and the idea of supremacism, in one form or another, are inextricable. And so, by implication, it is ideas about supremacism that need to be relinquished, or rather thought about and discussed. What, to put it as glibly as possible, is supremacism a self-cure for? If there was less racism, there would be more suicide. If racism is for us, insofar as there is an us in this room, a way of taking people seriously in all the wrong ways, we need a language, as D'Angelo makes very clear, that takes seriously whatever it is about themselves that people want taken seriously, without colluding with what we take to be their prejudices. One of their prejudices being in psychoanalytic terms, that they more or less know who they are and what they want. And they more or less know what racism is and where they stand in relation to it. This would entail, of course, a rather different kind of psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis just being one more way of taking people seriously. Whatever else trauma is, it is a necessary and determined narrowing of the mind in the service of survival. The traumatized part of ourselves is the self-obsessed part of ourselves, the part of ourselves that is always right, the part of ourselves that believes in the truth of our prejudices. After all, what else can we do with trauma but make it a special case? The special case it always is for the person or the people who suffer it and need it, albeit ambivalently, to be acknowledged. We have to imagine ways in which, or imagine if there are ways in which, the struggle for recognition that trauma necessitates, in this case the trauma of transgenerational and everyday racism, doesn't itself bring out the worst in people who need this recognition and the worst in the people they're addressing. The shame that racism entails is, by definition, resistant to articulation. Psychoanalysis could be described as, among other things, an attempt to do this. Redescription as the cure for trauma. Trauma being that which is not easily redescribed. When I qualified as a child psychotherapist in the 70s, my first job was at Camberwell Child Guidance Clinic in Peckham, in South London. Quite a lot of the adolescents I saw were Afro-Caribbean and there were only white people working the clinic and indeed on my train. In those days quite a lot of adolescents were referred by what was then called the Juvenile Bureau, a part of the police that worked with what they called juvenile offenders. They referred people to us as a last resort and the children had to attend, which was often and not always a non-starter in terms of therapy. Among the children I saw there were gang members who unsurprisingly didn't want therapy. So I would often begin by saying that I probably wouldn't come to a place like this if I was forced, but that I'd do what I could to make it interesting. That I'd try and find out what, if anything, I could do for them that they might want, as opposed to what other people wanted for them. After saying this to one Afro-Caribbean girl who was, she told me, a gang leader, she said to me, as though I hadn't said anything to her, there are no black people here. I acknowledged this, and then there was a silence. So I said, what do you think we should do about this? She said, close the place down. I said, or find some black people who want to work here. She said, are you fucking mad? Close the place down. I thought, but didn't say, that I partly agreed with her. Or at least I could see I thought what she meant. And also I didn't really agree with her. Though I thought that I could imagine what might make someone say or believe such a thing. What I think I felt at that moment was her enraged, despairing defiance and the obvious intelligence of it. And I felt a certain confoundedness, a belief in the potential value of psychoanalysis and indeed in the multiple inventive drives in child development, and the sense that this knowledge, this very belief, could be part of the problem. A shorthand for this would be simply that in D'Angelo's terms, my being part of a white supremacist culture guaranteed my belief in the value of psychoanalysis at the cost of any other competing cultural accounts. But what I took it that psychoanalysis could be useful for was for some people irrelevant and patronising beside the point, or a way of missing the point, like believing you can be kind to someone without knowing what kindness was for them. At the end of this mostly silent first session, she pointed to my black leather jacket that was hanging on the door and said contemptuously, why do you wear that? 
I said, it helps me pretend to be tough. And she burst out laughing and said, that's the story of my life, man. That's the story of my life. A positive white identity is an impossible goal, Robin DiAngelo writes in White Fragility. Quote, white identity is inherently racist. White people do not exist outside the system of white supremacy. This does not mean that we should stop identifying as white and start claiming only to be Italian or Irish or whatever. To do so is to not deny the reality of racism in the here and now, and this denial would simply be colorblind racism. Rather, I strive to be less white, to be less white is to be less racially oppressive. This requires me to be more racially aware, to be better educated about racism, and to continually challenge racial certitude and arrogance. To be less white is to be open to, interested in, and compassionate towards the racial realities of people of colour. To stop privileging the comfort of white people over the pain of racism for people of colour. To move past guilt into action. This seems to me to be at once uncontestable and contestable, and it's part of the value of D'Angelo's book that it would, I think, be impossible to be unaffected by it, for or against, even if the what is to be done part is less self-evident and is there to be argued, argued about, as she acknowledges. The idea, for example, of being less white, even though she means less white in a certain sense, seems unduly wishful, rather too pragmatic an abolition of history. You might think that the quantification of whiteness or blackness would be part of the problem. From a psychoanalytic point of view, insofar as it's useful, when we talk about racism, we're talking about a great deal of fear and a great deal of violence that is the self-cure for fear. We're talking about what, if anything, we can do with or about terror, and particularly the terror of frustration and difference. The poet Coleridge wrote in his notebook, Why is difference always linked with hatred? In psychoanalytic language, we can say, here we have fantasies of purity and danger, of difference being linked with unbearable harm and loss and threat and persecution, of difference more often than not assumed to be the problem than any kind of solution. That is to say, we think we know, we can formulate in the language of psychoanalysis, what racism is assumed to be and assumed to be the solution to. In shorthand, fear of difference as contamination and fear of curiosity about difference. And what might make someone feel that what they're suffering from is their racism, or not suffering from it, but taking pride in what it does for them? We can talk about the founding fragility of the ego, of omnipotence and omniscience as remedies for helplessness, of ambivalence, a conflict between love and hate, as being the psychoanalytic essentialisms, of envy as formative, of dependence on a mother, on a regime like white supremacism, as the groundwork of sociability, and so on. Indeed, it could seem, at least in the liberal idealist version of psychoanalysis, that psychoanalysis was invented to address our modern terrors of misogyny and racism. Misogyny and racism being our essential and essentialist organizing preoccupation, what Borges calls our essential perplexities. That if psychoanalysis is, is significantly useful, worth to some extent involving ourselves in, it would by definition have something good something practical and illuminating to say about misogyny and racism, and indeed about the police, something D'Angelo's book might support and endorse. And yet there are the familiar salient facts, facts that would suggest that, inevitably, psychoanalysis has been, if not a function of white supremacism, then at least somehow entirely of a piece with it, despite the disclaimers of analysts themselves. It took a very long time, as we know, for non-white people to do psychoanalytic trainings or to even be encouraged to be curious about them. It took a very long time for psychoanalytic training to include the reading and writing and discussing of racism and, indeed, misogyny as integral to the training. It took a very long time for writing by non-white clinicians and theorists to emerge. It took a very long time for the racism and the omission of issues about race to be acknowledged and interpreted in the canonical text of psychoanalysis. It took a very long time for non-white people to teach on analytic trainings or to be in positions of power and authority in psychoanalytic institutions. It would be naive to assume that psychoanalysis was of universal interest or that it would be everyone's cup of tea. It is, after all, really a kind of local knowledge and something of a period piece of its time and possibly only about a small group of people in a particular place. <laughs>
And yet, of course, the founding whiteness of psychoanalysis is not a mystery in D'Angelo's terms. There is apparently no way psychoanalysis could have been exempt, though it could conceivably have exempted itself rather more than it did from the white identities that invented and promoted it. White identity is inherently racist, she writes. White people do not exist outside the system of white supremacy. But, or and, as Foucault, among many others, have insisted, structure does not merely displace or abolish agency. People, as we know, innovate and improvise within regimes. What Foucault calls subjectivization, the ways in which we are forced and formed into being certain kinds of people by the languages and the groups we grow up in, by the diffuse and insidious concessions of power, is not solely and simply a tyranny. We may not only be the ventriloquist dummies of our culture, as Foucault sometimes seems to suggest we are. And this means that one of the questions we're always left with is what, in any given regime, militates against the possibility of reform or revolution? How come it took nearly 150 years for psychoanalysis before white supremacism was put on the analytic agenda? And given that the inventions of psychoanalysis were contemporary with the boom and bust of Western imperialism and its endemic racism, we're looking at, as it were, a significant blind spot. And that the fact that the language of psychoanalysis must be informed by the political and economic ethos in which it emerged, as though the infinite suffering that is racism was somehow unbearable or was construed as unbearable by the psychoanalysts themselves, as something unbroachable. And given psychoanalysis is about suffering and not about desire or dependence or sexuality or development, but, but about the suffering they entail. This seems to have been the suffering the psychoanalysts couldn't face or face up to. Many of the original British and American analysts being refugees from Nazism. Psychoanalysis, which has taught us, if it's taught us anything, to pay attention to what we omit, and especially to pay attention to the suffering we're inclined to shy away from. Prevailing belief that prejudice is bad, D'Angelo remarks, causes us to deny its unavoidable reality. Without taking refuge in righteous indignation and the seductions of guilt, or in generalizations about white people and non-white people, familiar versions of an endlessly inventive supremacism of one kind or another, what then might it mean, in D'Angelo's words, to be less white and to move past guilt into action? To be able to act, to speak, we may need to be sometimes less impressed by our guilt. Reviewing white fragility, the thing itself and the book itself, means seeing where it adds to the stock of available reality and where it is instructive and useful to disagree with. The title of the book itself being, in its way, at once sympathetic and perhaps too sympathetic in its misplaced loyalties, a kind of hostage to fortune, as it might imply that white people need to be protected and looked after, especially when they're being racist. And that if white supremacism is so powerful, then non-white people must be comparably weak. It may or may not be reassuring to assume that the astounding cruelty of white supremacism comes out of an overwhelming fragility. It may be that this fragility needs to be re-described. White fragility might mean, for example, a protection racket or a covert demand for compliance. What is referred to in the book as, quote, perhaps the most pernicious form of pressure on people of colour, the pressure to collude with white fragility by minimising their racial experiences to accommodate white denial and defensiveness. All this is really about not being able to re-describe this putative fragility in a way that might make something else possible. Other than placation or management, and by the same token, when anti-racist aggression is only described as destructive, rather than also sometimes being in the service of a closer contact or real engagement, something is lost. Too much regard in this example for white fragility fosters a mutual estrangement. Though one of the impressive things about white fragility, the book, is that D'Angelo wants, when it comes to issues of racism, to make straight talking compatible with tact and the management of shame and guilt, despite the fact, of course, that tact means different things to different people. She wants to find ways of getting white people to acknowledge and recognise their racism, and she is upbeat about it, which would seem to be a contradiction in terms. Quote, while we worry that if we have revealed our racism in any way, the people of colour in our lives will give up on us, I have found the opposite to be true. The continuous work of identifying my internalised superiority and how it may be manifesting itself is incredibly liberating. End of quote. Not only is racism morally bad, 
that relinquishing one's racism, one's internalized superiority, one's white supremacism can make us feel even better. This would seem to be true for everyone except for racists, whose racism by definition makes them feel morally good and much better. Racism, in other words, mirrors one of the central problems in psychoanalysis. If the unacceptable in ourselves is that which we repress, project, displace, delegate and deny, how can we be sure that acknowledging the unacceptable will get us the lives we claim to want, let alone make us feel better? Would the well-analysed person be by definition anti-racist? We may believe in, as it were, making the unconscious conscious, but how can we possibly know what will happen to us, what will we will become, having done so? In a world without scapegoats, there will be more, not less, conflict. What kind of lives will those free of racism be living together? White Fragility, the book, John McWhorter concluded in his review in The Atlantic, quote, is in the end a book about how to make certain educated white readers feel better about themselves. D'Angelo's outlook rests upon a depiction of black people as endlessly delicate poster children within this self-gratifying fantasy about how white America needs to think, or better, stop thinking. Her answer to white fragility, in other words, entails an elaborate and pitilessly dehumanizing condescension towards black people. The sad truth is that anyone falling under the sway of this blinkered, self-satisfied, punitive stunt of a primer has been taught by a well-intentioned but tragically misguided pastor how to be racist in a whole new way. End of quote. It is, of course, true, it is, of course, not nothing and true that D'Angelo's book has prompted him to write this. And, of course, if you write a book like D'Angelo's, or perhaps almost any book on racism that's not merely demar, de banal, you have to bear the ferocity of feeling it will unleash. And this can make people frightened to talk and frightened not to talk. There is the bearing of racist behaviour, and then there is the bearing of talking and writing about racism. Teaching people to be racist in a whole new way is both a warning and an acknowledgement, and a useful phrase. It warns us that in writing about racism, we may be implicitly confirming it to some people and reconstituting it. And it acknowledges the resilience of racism, that it may be here to stay, part of our cultural education programme, as it were. There seems, as both D'Angelo and McWhorter appear to agree, to be nothing else we can do but teach people not to be racist, because racism is something we learn. And this depends on what we take teaching to be, how we imagine teaching works, and our confidence in it. Even if psychoanalysis begins where teaching fails, or if psychoanalysis is really education by other means, racism at its most minimal forces us to think and talk differently about education. If racism is something we learn, then when we are talking about racism, what, who do we want to be judged by? The epigraph to the second section of this lecture is from Deleuze and Guattari's A Thousand Plateaus. Becoming is not to imitate or identify with something or someone. If white fragility, in John McWhorter's words, is teaching people to be racist in a whole new way, it would be useful to talk about how and in what sense people are taught or learn to be racist. And what kind of light, if any, psychoanalysis may be able to shed on this. Clearly, racial prejudice, like any kind of prejudice, can't be described as genetic, but rather as the product of certain kinds of acculturation. In the process of what Foucault calls subjectivization, the ways in which what we think of as our singularity, our subjectivity, is constituted by the cultures we grew up in, we are taught to desire and so to discriminate. In what Freud calls the earliest language of orality, we learn what to take in and what to expel. We learn what or who we supposedly need to get rid of or to control in order to get the lives we think we want. So for Freud, one of the primal scenes of education is teaching children the so-called facts of life, which is itself a drama about what the child is willing and able to take in. And it's interestingly enough, in discussing this, Freud needs to refer, in the casual racism, the white supremacism of 19th century anthropology, to what he calls primitive racism. It is, of course, in Freud's references to the so-called primitive, a crucial and constitutive term in his psychoanalytic work, that we can most easily track the, as it were, 
unconscious racism in his work, and of course in the work of many of his contemporaries. The primitive, the undeveloped, the non-white, always going together. Primitive races as the childhood of the race that culminates in Western white men. The idea, the anthropologist Tim Ingold writes, that so-called primitive tribes, or what today might be known more politely as indigenous people, are living fossils, surviving remnants of an era long since overtaken by the modern world and destined for disappearance. Nowadays, we tend to cringe at the word primitive. Racism, of course, does not cringe at such terms. Primitive, in this context, refers to all the people not worth listening to. What we call racism is, among other more terrible things, a decision about which people we believe we can learn from. In an interesting discussion in his 1937 paper, Analysis Terminable and Interminable, about people's capacity to acknowledge things as a way of not taking them in, as a way of defending themselves against something disturbing, Freud begins with the example of people resisting interpretation in psychonic treatment, and of this being somehow akin to the reading of psychoanalytic books. The patient hears our message, he writes, quote, but there is no response. The patient may think to himself, this is very interesting, but I don't feel any trace of it. We've increased his knowledge, but altered nothing else in him. The situation is much the same as when people read psychotic writings. The reader is stimulated only those, by those passages which he feels apply to himself, that is, which concerns conflicts that are active in him at the time. Everything else leaves him cold. We can have analogous experiences, I think, when we give children sexual enlightenment. I'm far from maintaining this is a harmful or unnecessary thing to do, but it's clear that the prophylactic effect of this liberal measure has been greatly overestimated. After such enlightenment, children know something they did not know before, but they make no use of this new knowledge. They're not even in so great a hurry to sacrifice for this new knowledge the sexual theories which might be described as a natural growth, and which they have constructed in harmony with and dependence upon their libidinal organisation. Theories about the part played by the stork, about the nature of sexual intercourse, and about the way in which babies are made. For a long time after they have been given sexual enlightenment, they behave like primitive races who have had Christianity thrust upon them and who continue to worship their old idols in secret. <coughs> The French psychoanalyst Pontelis comments on this passage, quote, an observation which deserves the attention of those who expect sexual education at school to provide the most fitting preparation for future marital harmony. What Freud is describing here is what we might call the effect of defensive recognition, our capacity to abolish something by acknowledgement of it, our way of dismissing things by learning about them. Or well, to put it more simply, Freud is giving us his psychoanalytic account of the origins and genesis of prejudice, of being, as we say, set in our ways to protect ourselves from the emergency of unpredictable change, which all change, in fact, is. By definition, we can never know where it will end. The resistant patient in psychotic treatment, the reader of psychoanalysis, the child being sexually enlightened, and, of course, the racist, are only interested in what they are interested in only believe what they believe. That is to say, they prefer the past to the future, the known to the unknown. Freud is wondering here, linking up, as I say, the resistant psychoanalytic patient, the reader of psychoanalysis, the child who refuses the facts of life, the primitive races who won't submit to Christianity. What are the preconditions for people allowing themselves, then, to be changed? Prejudice in this context would mean absolute antipathy to change, a state of unassailable conviction, an attempt to freeze time, an attempt to preempt or foreclose the future, a version of what the psychoanalyst Christopher Bowers calls a fascist state of mind, in which all self-doubt is dispelled, and which desire is desire simply and solely for confirmation of what one already believes. Prejudice requires continual reinforcement, Unlike one version of so-called scientific method, it is not in search of falsifying evidence. In this calculated and determined narrowing of the mind, there must be no news, only reassurance. Clearly, omniscience is the psychotic word for supremacism. And linked to this, by way of example, there is the behaviour of what Freud refers to as primitive races, 
who have had Christianity thrust upon them and who continue to worship their old idols in secret. The Jews also, and originally it should be noted, had had Christianity thrust upon them, some of whom went on worshipping their old idols in secret, despite the fact that Judaism itself is anti-idolatrous. Indeed, it was the project of Moses and the Jews that followed him to destroy idol worship, and some of whom were turning psychoanalysis into a new idol. Here, though, we may say that at its most minimal, Freud is, albeit ambivalently, declaring his and the Jews' identification with the primitive races. Jews, of course, in turn of the century of Vienna, knew something about in endemically socially sanctioned racism. The epigraph to the third and final section of this paper is from Richard Rorty's Pragmatism as Anti-Authoritarianism. On a pragmatist account, the only point of having beliefs in the first place is to gratify desires. Prejudice, one might say, is a desperate security operation. In the supposed interest of health, interest of health and safety, of sustaining a wished-for equilibrium, self-insulating measures need to be taken. At its most extreme, there is what the anthropologist Mary Douglas called purity and danger, the fear of poison and contamination and disarray that all forms of racism entail. So one of the many interesting aspects of Freud's account is that what we might call prejudice, storks bringing babies, is taken to be a defence against conversion, as though one of Freud's fears was that people may be unpredictably seducible, tempted by all sorts of transformation, that their suffering made people dangerously wishful. Racism then as a defence against conversion, but conversion to what? And if conversion is feared, what is this a fear of? One's desire to be seduced, transformed, estranged from one's recognised self, one's wish to float free of an imprisoning identity. If the psychoanalyst is somehow akin to a thrusting Christian missionary, as Freud implies, and primitive races are like children and people who resist psychoanalytic insight, we have a complicated equation on our hands. Psychoanalysis is like a rigid religion that tells people what they don't want to know. Changing people is actually like trying to convert them, and people are in many ways intractable. And of course, it's not clear why it would be better, or even good, for these so-called primitive races to relinquish their idols for Christianity. And despite the fact that the psychoanalyst in this case, like the sexual educator of children, is offering scientific truth, not religious opinion. In this account, Freud is, one might say, ambivalent about colonisation, and about the kinds of forced conversions it might entail. And he seems also to be ambivalent about psychoanalysis, which now seems comparable to a Christian conversion. Freud has got himself and his readers into a muddle. But he's not in a muddle about one simple and banal thing. The, but he is not in a muddle about one simple and banal thing that goes to the heart of the psychonic project and to the heart of white supremacism and the racism it needs to sustain itself. People are profoundly resistant to change even when they claim they want it as though all change is catastrophic change. And this is because fantasy is in one limited sense more satisfying than so-called reality, and prejudice is simply another word for fantasy. Fantasy, we should note, is much more fixed. It's under omnipotent control. It enables us, unlike so-called reality, to freeze time, formulate desire, turn flux into a regime. The wishes that constitute fantasy like racist fantasies, are static in their apparent dynamism and drive. Notice, for example, how repetitive romantic and pornographic fantasy is. So we must ask for any so-called prejudice, the various racisms and the various supremacisms that are inextricable. What wishes are they made up of? And what is assumed to be the cost, the loss, the catastrophe of giving up and giving up on these particular wishes? It being one of the striking facts about racism that its language never evolves. There's never any real news in the language of supremacism and its racisms. Freud concludes this late, rather pessimistic late paper by describing what he takes to be the fundamental resistance that the analyst comes up against in their patients. We often have the impression, he writes, that the wish for a penis in women and the masculine protest in men, their repudiation of their femininity, we have penetrated through all the psychological strata and have reached bedrock, and that thus our activities are at an end. 
What we learn, Freud writes, quote, is that it's not important in what form the resistance appears. The decisive thing remains that the resistance prevents any change from taking place, that everything stays as it was. This is, of course, in hindsight, an ironic statement for us. Freud's prejudice is to assume that there is a universal resistance to what he calls femininity. And in giving his account of this, he's describing the origins and genesis of a prejudice. In this case, his prejudice that everyone hates femaleness, that we are determined to protect and live with our misogyny. What Freud calls resistance is what we might call prejudice. And the implication is that we hold ourselves together with our prejudices. That to relinquish a prejudice, the possibility of overcoming a defence, throws us into disorientation and terror. To relinquish a prejudice, to modify a defence, is to precipitate a catastrophe. Or more simply, it precipitates into that emergency that existed before the defence, and that defence was mobilised to protect us from. If psychoanalysis has anything to do with white supremacism, apart, that is, from being a product of it, it also offers us a treatment, a therapy, organised around the whole issue of prejudice, of what it is about ourselves we supposedly cannot bear to change, and why that might be. If beliefs are described <coughs> in the pragmatic way as habits of action, symptoms are more like regimes than habits. It's instructive, in other words, to see, in the psychotic way, our prejudices as solutions and self-cures. And so to wonder, by the same token, what problems, what terrors, were these prejudices originally the solution to, the self-cure for? Anything as fiercely held onto as a prejudice must be serving some apparently and urgent function. What a prejudice is about is as, if not more significant, than what it is used to do, and how it is used to do it. Our prejudices are our, as yet, preferred forms of safety. Psychoanalysis addresses whatever it is that any in given individual finds unacceptable, and how the unacceptable is managed. When this is not focused on sexuality and instinctual life in general, or an external trauma in particular, it is clear now that it is about racism in general and in particular. We can talk of psychoanalysis, given the time and place of its invention, as at once a symptom of racism and an attempted cure for it. We may or may not all be racists, but we all have suppositions and presumptions and convictions, that is prejudices, that we are extremely unwilling or unable to relinquish or to revise about other people. As D'Angelo's book makes abundantly clear, racism is something we are enmeshed in, over and above our individual choices and preferences. My psychosocial development, she writes, quote, was inculcated in a white supremacist culture in which I am in the superior group. Telling me to treat everyone the same is not enough to override this socialization, nor is it humanly possible. I was raised in a society that taught me that there was no loss in the absence of people of color, that their absence was a good and desirable thing to be sought and maintained, while simultaneously denying that fact. This attitude has shaped every aspect of my self-identity, my interests and investments, what I care about and don't care about, what I see or don't see, what I'm drawn to, what I'm repelled by, what I can take for granted, where I can go, how others respond to me, and what I can ignore. Most of us would not choose to be socialised into racism and white supremacy. Unfortunately, we didn't have that choice. While there is variation in how these messages are conveyed and how much we internalise them, nothing could have exempted us from these messages completely. End of quote. To be victimised does not in and of itself make one a victim. And one of the drawbacks and benefits of D'Angelo's book is that it shows how both white supremacists, all white people in her view to some extent, or all white people who don't challenge white supremacism, and the victims of racism are both casualties and victims of the system of supremacism. And what we tend to call prejudice in others more frequently than in ourselves is the currency, the medium of all supremacism. Prejudice, like the supremacism in all its forms, is there as a distance regulator. It separates us from what or who we feel endangered by. In psychoanalysis, these prejudices, these assumptions about oneself, are called symptoms. And by redescribing prejudices as symptoms, Freud made it possible for us to believe that we can reconsider ourselves, that we can revise our more violent 
and fantasy fueled forms of self protection are prejudices. A symptom can be re described, a prejudice by definition cannot be. A symptom may be cured, a prejudice as a refuge and a tyranny has to be defended and inflicted and endured. Thank you. Do feel free not to ask a question. Yeah, so you can just say something. <clears throat> I suppose I, I, I could I could start us off just to get us going because I I had an experience that's that's happened before at these at your lectures, which is that you're talking about some other profession and and I suddenly feel oh my god <laughs> this is this is about what what we do here and I mean you began by talking about your own experience of education um, and I was certainly immediately remembering things that happened in my education at the same sort of age but then there was also a moment when you reflected on psychoanalysis in, in relation to racism and, and talked about how just how slow the process of thinking about this even though it would be an obvious topic and this seems so true about higher education I've, I mean, I've, I've lived and worked and taught in three or four institutions over my life, and they've all considered themselves to be, as we would call, you know, liberal institutions, and two of them better than the other one, have been actually rather good at teaching something like a history in relation to racism, as long as it's a history of, say, imperialism or something like that. But I'd say all of them have been incredibly bad at reflecting upon their own institutional structures, how they work, the sorts of people who work here, the sorts of people who study here, uh, and very, uh, until recently, really until almost, as it seemed, too late, unable to reflect on, uh, on those sorts of questions. So uh, I just wondered if you, if you had any thoughts about well, it's, it's almost like that. this is an example of how ideology really works, which is, it doesn't occur to you, it wouldn't occur to you. But suddenly, Black Lives Matter, suddenly all these terrible things are happening, all terrible things are happening for a very long time. But suddenly it's as though lots of people are really woken up to this. And it's as though before that, we've lived in a completely taken for granted reality. Mm. There was nothing to question. It wasn't an issue until it became an issue. Mm. And it's in some ways a, a very vivid and rather horrifying example of what it means for something to be unconscious. Mm. That it becomes tacit shared knowledge. So there is nothing to talk about. It isn't a topic or an issue or a preoccupation. And that must be how this works. That it, it, that's how real repression works. So that if, if you say to me, um, if I say to you, um, can you give me the directions to go to Oxford? And you say, ignore the signs for Reading. In order to ignore the signs for Reading, I have to look at them first. That's what repression is. You see something, and then you absolutely and totally discard it, as though it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So. Nobody can presumably not see racism and the effects of colonialism and imperialism and all this, but it was seen and then absolutely not seen. And it's like, this is, it's like thinking, and this is something that we are capable of doing. And it's startling. And it, of course, makes you think, and what else are we doing this about? How much is there that is simply taken for granted? And you could think, one of the reasons we valued liberal education was it was precisely about that is about the taken for granted. But, but it's so shocking and so powerful. And you can see how it's very adaptive. In some ways, it's much more convenient for some people to think there's no such thing as racism if they're, as it were, ahead and on top. But it's very, very inconvenient to start thinking about it. It's really disturbing. And, 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 in a, and you can see the effect, which is that there's an escalation of disturbance. And so I think an awful lot of people now feel as traumatised as they did and should and will be and can see no way out of it. 
Could you take off your mask to speak? Yeah. Thanks. Um, so, particularly in the past few years, we've seen a lot in the news about education about race for, um, you know, sort of particularly what we would consider like, you know, key stage three, very young people. And I know in the US there's been a hot topic of what they call critical race theory. And then in the UK, I think it was earlier this year, uh, announces of sort of thinking about bringing in um, studies about uh, particularly the uh, slavery in the Caribbean and things like that and there's been great great resistance to it um, both here and in the US um, in uh, in your view how how is something like this that has been ignored and has been resisted against for so long implemented when there's such a history yeah. of just disregarding it like you say and ignoring it um, and, 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 and resisting it so how, how is something like this even implemented? Um, well, that it seems to me <clears throat> that is the question. And in a way, that's the question that prompts this lecture. Because you think, well, so the question is, what is to be done? And for me, it's very powerful, the idea that you can learn something and, be, and, and agree with it and believe it and be absolutely unaffected by it. And, you know, sometimes you think, well, are people going to be less racist? Or rather, what are we going to teach people such that it will induce them to be less racist? In other words, is the project, as it were, to make people feel guilty or ashamed? Or can we provide good reasons why people need not be only racist, say? Or what might be a relation to, I mean, Lacan talks somewhere of the desire for absolute otherness. In other words, a real belief here that other people, and that could mean other races, but could just mean other people, could be absolutely different from ourselves. And how would we then live with other people if we believed that was true? And it seems to me, I mean, it's, it's very difficult not to be um, despairing in the sense that there are such long-standing transgenerational histories of exploitation and brutalization, et cetera, et cetera. You think, how could anybody, how's anybody going to recover from this? And, and that is where psychoanalysis comes in, not as the answer to the question, but it seems to me one of the things it tries to address, and, and often fails, is how people, what people can do with their transgenerational traumas. You know, both the things that have actually happened to them in their lives, but the things that happened to their grandparents or their great-grandparents, which in some way are passed down. And so I think in a way, your question is the question, which is, and it seems to me it involves rethinking education. Because if we want education to make a difference to this, we're going to have to really rethink pedagogy. And I think quite often, psychoanalysis turns up where education fails. Because in a way, psychoanalysis addresses um, what, what you resist, how you resist taking some things in. You know, why, how it works out that you have your own internal economy of censorship. And so it's about um, how people resist, A, knowing what they know, and B, knowing what they don't know. And for some people it's useful. There must be other, all sorts of ways of doing this. But I think we have to take seriously, and I hope this is said in the paper, that people really need their prejudices. And I don't know that, we should therefore reinforce them, but we shouldn't underestimate the terror of relinquishing a prejudice. And so it would seem to me that, that those would be the kind of conversations one might want to have. You know, what would your life be like if you didn't believe gay people were evil? You know, how would you actually live it? What's the catastrophe you fear? And it can't all be done like that, and it can't all be done by persuasion. But it seems to me there isn't anything else. You know, I can only think of talking and then ultimately violence, presumably. But violence creates a thing it's, you know, organised to, to um, abolish. Do you, I don't want to put you on the spot here at all, but do you have a thought about this? Uh, thoughts on reform of education? No, not particularly. <laughs> um, um, I think it is very similar to what we have seen recently, um, especially in the US, with things like mask and vaccine mandates and like you said it is fear and I think especially from a personal perspective it was easy to be frustrated why people aren't doing it and then it was the acknowledgement that people are afraid 
Yeah. Um, people are scared of change, and people are scared of, like like you said, the unknown. And and I think a lot of this comes from historical fears. You know, uh, that are you know one of a hundred conspiracy theories actually turns out to be true. And you're like, well, what else is true? Yeah. And um, yeah. I uh, yeah, I, it's it's acknowledgement of fear. I think, but you know, like you mentioned in the paper, it's also not wanting to give people in those positions of having uh, racist prejudices, you know, uh, money coddling them about it. It's trying to find a balance. Yeah. It's, it's incredibly difficult. Yeah, true. I mean, in a way, the question is why are people so frightened of each other? And on the one hand, you say, well, because you can see, but it's still a question. <coughs> Thank you. There's a question just here. Um, in terms of reforming education, I think there's been steps done at the moment, like really new ones. I think for me, the only thing I ever learned about black history was the slave trade, and I think if, I think York specifically is trying to become more inclusive, like with black writers and philosophers and psychologists and everything. But to what extent do you think that has a limitation, considering that the people teaching us, and actually the vast majority of like higher academics. Like, and all that are white, yeah. so only a B from their perspective. Well, it's, I mean, it's a real symptom or reflection, isn't it, what we're talking about, of the problem. Because you could think, you know, the, the, the obvious place to start here is for people to be able to speak for themselves. And, and then the question is, and how do you facilitate people speaking for themselves? Because, again, and I don't remotely want to promote or overpromote psychoanalysis here because it's a lot of limitations. But psychoanalysis, unlike politics or doctors or parents or rabbis, psychoanalysis is about enable people people to speak for themselves. The analyst, if they're good, don't speak on someone else's behalf. So it would seem it would be something to do with, and I can only think of this in a very, very crude way, which is to do with um, finding ways of people enabling people to be less frightened of their curiosity. So instead of the reaction to difference being hatred, repudiation, etc., there could be some curiosity. There could be a feeling that there's something interesting here. But it's, what you've described as you know, universe teaching is exactly the same as psychoanalysis, which is that it's almost entirely white. And well, certainly when I worked at Campbell, Charles Gunsclick, the children I saw were almost entirely Afro-Caribbean. And that's why when that girl said to me, close it down, I thought, well, yes, but, that, but closing it down in and of itself isn't going to solve this problem or help. I, it seems to me it's inevitable, given, given the nature of white supremacism, that we, whoever we are, would be at universities where most of our teachers are white. But, or and, that, that may change, it may evolve. But this is going to be, I would have thought, incredibly slow. And slowness means a great deal of frustration, even more frustration. But my only hope is that there are more educated, frustrated people. In other words, more people who've got a language to voice their frustration in. But it's, the, you know, it's like the thing Sartre said, um, rebels keep the world the same so they can go on rebelling against it. Revolutionaries change the world. So I think, you know, if we're not going to die of rights indignation, we have to work out what to do. Hello. Um, you mentioned, you quoted D'Angelo saying, uh, to be less white is to be less facially oppressive. Um, I guess I was thinking of, but what about the extreme, you know, in a sense to be more black, and then this problem of cultural appropriation. So how do we make sure we don't overstep that boundary? Like, how do we kind of, like, um, strike a balance between between those two. Well, I agree, and I think that's why it's a, it's this less and more black and white stuff. I think is a dead end, really. It can't be like that. And she does qualify it in the book. And you know what she means is being less white be, means being less of a white supremacist. And what that means is being able to have conversations in which one's white supremacism is thought about and challenged. But I think that's in a way. You can't be more or less white or more or less black. I think it isn't like that. It's not quantifiable. It's much more to do with the nature of the conversations you want and can have. 
so in the uh, in the kind of modern world we live in, racism, like you were saying, can be very umbral, very easy to kind of it, it happens, but it's so stealthy almost. It can be brushed away by white people, and when we choose not to uh, admit that it's happening, but also it can be violent and harsh, and obviously with television televised to millions of people. I mean, when we talk about education reform, um, we can. Um, obviously be, be taught more about these histories of, of oppressed people, which is a good thing, but it necessarily exists within this ultra-violent system towards those same minorities that we're trying to highlight. And I just wanted to ask, do you think, um, what, what kind of path on a broader systemic level do we need to kind of square those two things about, um, you know, having, you know, trying to give a, a light to these historically oppressed people, but also that same educational system being in some part sponsored by the oppressive system itself? I mean, I just, like all of us, I really don't know. I only know a bit about the professional world I work in. And I'm not saying this is exemplary or representative at all. But what's happened in psychoanalysis is there's been a huge influx of various different kinds of non-white people um, training to be psychotherapists from the predicament we're talking about. And, of course, they, unsurprisingly, have rather a different view of psychoanalysis than all of us did and do. And that seems to me, in a way, the only hope here, which is that um, they, in their diversity, can make something of it, as opposed to submit to it. And it seems to me, in a way, it's always about what, what, what someone can use something to do, not what they have to abide by. And I think, and, and I'm struck by this, that certainly a lot of the people, um, some of the people I supervise are um, Afro-Caribbean, African, um, Asian, and so on, and from quite diverse backgrounds. And these people can all use and are genuinely interested in psychoanalysis. doesn't mean they're devotees or they, they're committed to it, but they find it part of a useful way of thinking about these things. And that would seem to me as good as it's going to get in my little bit of the world, that something can be used and transformed and adapted. So it ceases to be a regime and becomes a tool. And, and, I, and it is, I know from experience that it is definitely changing the practice of psychoanalysis. It, apart from anything else, it's made it much less elitist and much less sort of intellectually elitist much less of a club that it's clear only 10 people can join. That's good. Thank you. It might seem um, uh, to, um, uh, to, to sort of anecdotalise the, the, the question that you were raising, but I just want to go back to that question of just uh, of reform and how quick it, it can be. Because um, I'm reminded that people here might not be able to remember this, but there was a time within our lifetimes, in which the presence of women in universities was actually very small. Um, and when, uh, when there was a lot of discussion of this in the, in the 60s and 70s and quite a lot of change was happening, um, I've got just one interesting anecdote in relation to it. That there was, uh, Cambridge colleges at the time, the Oxford colleges, were going from being all male or all, me all female to being mis mixed environments. And it was pointed out at one point that a male college Ten years later, still on the teaching staff, the number of women was something like, I think, below 10%. And the answer was, it takes a lot of time. You have to train people, it takes years. Uh, there's you know, all the processes, it's very complicated. Give us 50 years, you know, things will go better. It was then pointed out that a, a female college that had also gone mixed in that period had gone from entirely female uh, staff to 50-50 within 10 years. So it was possible for the speed to happen much more quickly one way round than the other. And uh, I think in some ways we, you know, we, we need to stop talking quite so much about the syllabus that we're teaching and think much more about these institutional questions yeah. of, 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 of who it is that a university is. I've got a, I mean, you, you made, you, that, that story was just brutal when you said it, the story of close it down. And I have to say that, you know, a, a bit of me at that point is tempted to say, you know, uh, you know just fire me uh, and, and let's start again. Yeah. 
Um, but obviously that's not the solution. But I do think that we are, in some sense, we give in too easily to that question of you know, that, that answer, it takes time. But it's also interesting that it gives one apocalyptic thoughts. Yeah. Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah, just, just throws the whole thing down start again. And you think, well, yes, why not? Yeah. Yeah. You touched on it briefly uh, in your essay, um, language. Um, and I know, uh, particularly in my personal circles, the topic of racism as a term, not just referring to racial prejudice, but specifically of the power that historically white people have had over POCs. How much do you agree with that statement and how important do you think that distinction is? Well, it must be crucial, mustn't it? I mean, the sense of, it, it would seem to me there's, there's no other way of, of thinking about this than historically. What's very difficult to do, partly because it's horrifying and unbearable, and partly because it's just difficult, is tracing the effects as they're passed down through the generations. But it would seem to me that it would have to be the, the sort of groundwork of all this are tracing these genealogies, tracing these histories, seeing the effects, seeing what people have been able to make of their histories. So you don't, because I think what's very debilitating is telling a story that's entirely about victimization. And I, and I think in a way, it, it, it's much more interesting to tell a story about how people have found ways of surviving impossible situations, unbearable situations. What kind of tactics and strategies and, and, and ways they've come up with of doing that and how they then suffered for their adapt suffered from their adaptations. You know, it's like alcoholics are not suffering from alcohol. They're suffering from what the alcohol was originally medicating. But it but it's very difficult to get back to that. So it looks as though what an alcoholic needs to do is to stop drinking. Well, I think that, you know, these racial histories are a bit like that, which is we have to look at um, what these have been self-cures to or for. And also, I think, which is less, more distasteful, is to be thinking about or having conversations about what, what, for example, is being a white supremacist a solution to? What's that a self-cure for? Otherwise, we're going to have a sort of Manichaean history of bad people and good people. And obviously that's going to be no use to anybody. So we have to start not from a sort of wet liberal view, but we have to start from the position that uh, everybody has good reasons for what they do, and we have to allow people to be as complicated as they may be. That would be my wish. I mean, it's very, very wishful, but that's my wish. Um, you mentioned in the paper that you know racism and white supremacism, specifically that held by racists, is a defensive posture. And you've also mentioned that people need their prejudices as well, that they're sort of very important to them. And within sort of, as a personal anecdote, I have seen like, um, you know, friends, parents and that sort of thing, you know, become very attached to that idea of sort of conservatism and, you know, sort of becoming all, to the point where it almost comes to sort of define their personality. And so it's very clear that that prejudice that they hold is very important to them. And I suppose my question for you is like, how do you, if, if that is so vital to their, it has come to define them, it has become a significant part of their personality, how do you begin to almost decode that from them? Or to, to sort of, how do you begin to deconstruct that? Well, in a way, that's what one is doing in psychoanalysis. I don't know what you mean by that, because I the only way to deal with this. But I think it's something to do with, on the one hand, it's like the, the thing about alcohol, which is, on the one hand, you try and work out with somebody what this prejudice was invented for. What's it doing for somebody? The other thing which is, of course, more alluring is that the prejudice itself is very confining. That there's more life outside the prejudice than inside it. But there's a great deal of fear. And so it would be something to do with um, conversations in which somebody is shown the possibility that their prejudice is one of the ways they starve themselves. That it's actually an attack on their pleasure and an attack on their development. It's like freezing time. So I would be wanting to be, I'd be trying to seduce people with the idea of more life. Not really a question, but somewhat linked with what we just heard. I think early you said, wrote, 
that a world with less racism would be a world with more suicide. And I assume that's because you're thinking that one of the self-cures for the racist is the racism and that locates their self-hatred in the other, something like that. But, and you spoke about Foucault and the environment, the culture determining a lot of what we can imagine ourselves to be. And it just got me thinking of another Richard Rorty quote that I've heard you use many times, which is that everything that's deep inside of us, we've put there ourselves. And I don't have a really question, it just kind of made me feel queasy. Does that, yeah. is there anywhere to go with that? Not a question? Well, I think, I mean, I th the thing about suicide is, if you take it that, um, <coughs> Racism is scapegoating, that we attribute to other people things about ourselves we can't bear, and we attack them. That's one story about this. Well, if people then were to acknowledge that these are attributions of past themselves they can't bear, the question is, would they then be able to bear themselves? Um, and I think it's possible that quite a lot of people might not be able to, or they don't know whether they could, and therefore they can't. So that it's, it's very tricky, this, because obviously the liberal view is we'll get the life we want when there's less racism. And some people will, but some people won't. They'll be too terrified of themselves, or terrified of something, or depressed about something. But there's something unbearable, otherwise we wouldn't need to persecute anybody else. That seems to, that seems to be the logic of this. It may not be true entirely, but that's the logic of it. Hi. Um, my question is mainly about English as a subject. Um, in recent years, many universities have claimed to be decolonizing their curriculum, including this one. Um, but to what extent do you think this can be achieved? But because there are many ways to view this, like English as a language or English as a school of thought. So, yeah. I because I'm not in the university in the sense that you are now, although of course I was once. I don't know this from the inside. It would seem to me from the outside that whatever the phrase decolonizing the curriculum means, it must have something that's quite important in it. And again, it's to do with histories. It's about, it seems to me, it's about trying to work out how things have come to this or what they have come to and how this has happened. And it would seem to me that you, now, I don't see how you could do, you may not be able to decolonize the curriculum, because I don't know what that would mean exactly, because it doesn't seem to me comparable to decolonization of countries. But there may be overlaps, and the overlaps might matter. In other words, you know, first of all, what did this, what was this before it was colonized? What's been the effect of colonization? And what are the possibilities of decolonization here? You know, what's really viable? And that's it's got to be compelling, I would have thought. Because otherwise, there's a whole huge swathe of history, virtually a constitutive history, that's being ignored. Thank you. In terms of uh, acknowledging like an individuals or cultures, um, white supremacy through looking at like history and like a historical past, what do you think of countries where such a colonial history towards Africa or... Um, yeah. Those kind of may, may not be like as present or easy to find, such as like Eastern Europe, where racism is a lot more prevalent than here, yet the history behind it may not be as visible. Well, it's a real problem, this, isn't it? Because history comes in words. So it's, it's, it's going to be dependent on the languages that are actually available. And the histories we, I mean, the histories we can trace are going to depend upon the languages that are available. But it would seem to be one of the things that is happening now, and because, because your question obviously is, is very pertinent to this, which is um, how can we trace histories where there is no history? Or where there's, there's only the history written by the ruling class or the winners and all that stuff. That would seem to me to be a crucial bit of this. And this is going to, I imagine, involve the redescribing the nature of historical writing and the nature of historical teaching. Because people have got to be sometimes interested in invisible histories, and therefore they're going to have to speculate. And it's going to be conjectural. But conjectural history could be very, very useful for some people. That it is possible to imagine these things. That we could imagine what it's like to be somebody else. We can't be totally, but we could a bit. And the bit might matter. And I was at a, I gave the first third of this paper 
at a conference on psychoanalysis and racism. And a woman described the fact that she, she was a therapist herself. She ran a group of, for white people about racism. And she described a woman driving to the group, pulls up at a traffic light, looks across the car next to her, and there's a woman who's driving the car next to her, is wearing a burqa. She has the thought, God, they can drive. She goes to the group and she says this, obviously because this is the point of the group. And one of the things we were being offered in this conference was the idea that this in and of itself was a good thing. Now, it may be a better thing than not saying it, but the question is, what happens then? Once we've acknowledged this racist thought, and presumably in a white supremacist culture, we're all having racist thoughts, but then what, what do you make of them? What do you do with them? Or how do you re-describe them? That, which means they're not simply, this is not simply confessional. That we're not just expelling our bad thoughts. You know, how can they be metabolized or given back in a different form? And that, I think, is part of this history thing you're talking about, which is how can you give people back what they give in a way that they actually want to listen to it or want to be interested in it? Um, in the conversations that we've been having this evening, I think that a lot of it has been centering around black people and white people. So I would like to ask, how would you include other people of color in the discussion? Because Racism is not only towards black people, but it, it is faced by many people of color. Being one myself, I feel that we are also at the center of it. So how would you say that? How would you place other people of color at the center of this discussion? Well, I think I said in the paper that racism isn't one thing. Because we're talking about the fact there's a great diversity of people in the world. Um, and so, and, and again, D'Angelo's book is rather good in the sense that she acknowledges explicitly that any interesting convers or useful conversation about racism has to be as inclusive as is humanly possible. Uh, but insofar as we're stuck with words like white and black and Jew and so on, in other words, where the language reinforces the problem it's trying to undo. And I think, all, I don't know what you think, but I think all one could do in this situation is go on saying the kind of thing you just said, which is, it's more complicated than that, or it's being oversimplified in these categories, which must be true. Um, I uh, think that's been an extraordinary discussion and, uh, and one that's uh, provoked as much in, in the questions that are being asked as, as in the answers that are being given. So I, I want to thank all of you uh, for coming, for all of you for in, in, in engaging uh, with, uh, with Adam's uh, fantastic lecture. And, uh, and to welcome you back next time, which will be uh, sometime in the in the new year uh, for for another uh, lecture by Adam. But in the meantime, as always, Adam, uh, that was fantastic. And thank well, you so much. Thank you as well.